Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. This is an outtake episode. I was uh, honored to be on a panel with Jeremy Lee, uh, I think put it together, or for Steve Menzi of the uh, the Virtual Expo, but also uh, Chris McGill and Carvin Chung, again, very distinguished panel. I encourage you to, I don't know to what extent you can get it later or sign up or whether it's on YouTube, but this is just seven minutes of some things that I said that I just thought I want to add it to my record. So here's the stuff that I think is less duplicative. The whole episode was good, but thanks sponsors, Top Spinini and Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huxton Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, and, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, and CompC.com. So thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the whole thing if you can. If not, this is a teaser and sign up for next year. So this virtual stuff is the real deal. Thanks. I, I think what's wrong with society <laughs> is that supposedly educated people are not able to argue both sides of an issue. Even in this issue, it, it seems obvious that kids are being priced out. Well, they are being priced out of certain products, but they're not being priced out of the hobby. If you think about, as Chris was saying, <laughs> this is a demand-driven hobby. For kids to have it be this aspirational that, hey, I'm trying to get cards and they're too expensive, they're too hot, it's not necessarily a bad problem. Like uh, Carvin was saying, I want that Ferrari too, but you're <laughs> going to start with a Cutlass. Actually, Carvin, I got to tell you, I actually started with a Cutlass. There's many ways to to be active in the hobby. You don't just have to open up products. You can still take $10, $100, and you can go shopping. You can go shopping on ComC. You can go shopping on eBay. You can go to a card show. You can find cheaper cards out there and still have some fun. You just have to understand that, yeah, until you are in a position to afford the luxury items, you might just have to wait and work your way up there. As a species, we're pretty impatient. Sometimes it's hard to do, but... You got to just do what you can. There's lots of ways in. And one thing I like to tell people is Halloween's a great time to take cards and put them in team bags and give them away on Halloween. But the trick is you also have to give away the chocolate bars. You can't just give the kids <laughs> baseball cards or hockey cards or basketball cards. But taking 10 cards, putting them in a team bag and giving them away on Halloween is a great way to grow the hobby, in my opinion. We are in this era of single licenses for all the four big sports. Is it conducive? to the growth of the hobby. Jim, you've been around a long time in this hobby. You've seen multi-licenses. You've seen pre-1990, before Upper Deck even be came into the space. What, what are your thoughts now after seeing the different eras we've been through in terms of licensees? It's a good way to express the question, Jeremy. If I break it up into three periods, the recent period where we've had single licensees, the time before that where there was a lot of chaos, and then the time from 1980 and before which tops had it all to themselves. I'm hard pressed now to think this is the good new days. This is as good as it's ever been in terms of the growth of the industry. So the social experiment of do single licensees work, we've had spectacular growth. Now you go back and you get into the 90s and the 80s, and I think the category was growing, but it wasn't healthy. A lot of the companies went out of business and they were competing against each other and it, it was chaos. And I was thinking that back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when Topps had it all to themselves, gee, they were the only licensee, that must have been bad after they bought out Bowman. But if you look at 59 Topps Baseball, 69 Topps Baseball, 79 Topps Baseball, I bet there's a double-digit compound interest growth in the category with some order, with the Topps being the single licensee, and probably the same thing in football. And they didn't do basketball every year. So I was thinking that, gee, it was terrible when we just had tops. Actually, the car would have had better quality control <laughs> if we'd had another licensee. But the category was healthy. It was growing. And the category is healthy and growing now. Hard to argue against. We don't have a vote in it. So that's my contrary <laughs> viewpoint. We only have voices, but whether or not the leagues and the PAs are listening is another question. Uh How much would you want any of these sports or these categories to grow? They're already breaking apart at the seams, but are really asking for even more competition that would lead to greater sales and greater growth. I, I think we got to be really careful. I don't think the leagues and the player association are upset. <laughs> I think they're getting more and more royalties every year. Collectors and investors. This has been a hot topic for about a year now. The fact that there's a lot of investors in the space, not just collectors anymore. How do collectors and investors coexist in the hobby ecosystem? Are they necessary for each other in a way. Obviously, we want symbiosis to work off each other. But if there aren't 
enough collectors that to me, collectors are the more important. Investors are going to come and go. Collectors are going to be coming and stay and have been here for a long time. But investors, I don't know if they're ignoring collectors, but some of the decrease in prices, ironically, in the last six months, cards that have dipped have been because of collectors bringing out their cards and setting world record prices consistently. Those cards are coming out from the collectors and it's not a bottomless pit, but it seems to me some of these cards that are base cards, even in great condition, there's enough of them that when the price goes up, they're going to keep going. So collectors and investors need to cooperate more and not each one vilifying the other. If they do, they'll realize that symbiosis is what's going to cause the hobby to have an enduring and sustainable growth. And we're talking about sustainability of the hobby. We're talking about people coming in, keeping them in. The next one, the next topic I want to bring up is the narrative that is created by content. Because I'm seeing a lot of content with a negative spin. A lot of YouTube thumbnails that start with, this, is the sports card market crashing? The, the, the negative, that gets people to click. That's good for the content creators because it gets people to click through. And that's good for the YouTube algorithm. But is that really healthy for the hobby? Do we even care? He likes analogies, but if you apply it to music... What's going on in the narrative out there is it's not symphonic, it's not cacophonic, it's not jazz, it's everybody doing what they want to do and seeing what sticks, okay? That's not the kind of music I'd want to listen to, but then you find out I need to tune out these discordant voices and I need to put together people that I want to hear from. And over time, you're probably going to weed out those who are sensational headlines without as much substance. And you're going to go to card ladder to see, okay, what does the data say? Instead of somebody telling me that, that their opinion is something's going to crash. In the world of music, a lot of people have different tastes. I love the fact there's lots of different voices out there. But like I said, the, the problem is not how many likes you have or followers you have. If you're leading them astray, that's bad. But hopefully people are going to wise up. Like I said, the educated person in this industry needs to be able to argue both sides of, hey, I think things are going up, but here's some reasons why maybe it's going down. If they do that and take a balanced view, then they're going to listen and watch these YouTubers and podcasts in a way that they get a benefit. And your show, Jeremy, just to give you a plug, you're doing a variety of interviews with people that come from lots of different perspectives. That's what they need. They need not a symphony of voices because they're not all singing from the same sheet of music, but they need to hear a lot of music.